Yeah. All right, good. I think officially afternoon now, everybody. I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I'm Will. I work at the North Carolina State University Libraries with. And I'm David. And I also work with Will at the NC State University Libraries. And we're representing a team of really, really incredible people. Some of the names you see up there as well. We're excited to talk to you today about something we've been thinking and talking a lot about. Thank you, David. Next slide about open pedagogy and about our, our sort of quest to take it from a really, really cool one on one or small group activity to something that scales in the way that open educational resources can scale really, really well. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we mean when we use that term open pedagogy. We're going to talk about this project that we've been working on called the incubator that we've done at an individual institutional level at a state sort of consortial level and then at a few other levels as well. So very, very quickly here. We, a lot of us came in the door to talk about cost, and we recognize that there are really important reasons around equity, around strategy, and so forth, to think about and talk about cost as part of what we talk about when we talk about open education. Next slide, please. Thank you. But we also recognize that it's not enough to stop there, that open education can't simply be about cost. There are, I think, pretty important reasons around equity and transformative pedagogies that make us think about more than just cost. There are also really important strategic reasons that I could talk to you at great length about, about why I think open pedagogy and open practices are a really important part of what we want to talk about when we talk about open education. The open license and the sort of open enabled stuff is a small part of that, but I'll let my friend Robin on the next slide say it much better than I could, which is that this as a movement can't just be a movement about replacing crappy expensive textbooks with crappy free textbooks. That open education has to be about a vision that is about making it better. If you talk to an open science person, they'll say open science is just another term for science done right or science done well. And I think open education similarly should be about education done right or education done better. That's the open piece of it. So again, Robin said it better and faster too. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a really, really big area. And in the next 15 or minutes or so, I don't think I could do it justice. So I'll commend to you Virginia's article among many, many others if you want to get into the nitty gritty of what is all this What's the difference between an OEP and open pedagogy and all that other stuff? That's a super fun conversation to have, um, but one that we're not going to talk about much more beyond this right now, except to say that when we talk about it at NC State, in North Carolina, and the places that we have these conversations, this framing has been pretty useful for us. The idea that open pedagogy or open educational practices are an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education. Oh, come back. So when we break that down, we think about an um, access-oriented commitment on the next slide as being um, this idea of equitable pedagogies, of one size doesn't fit all. That when we talk about this stuff, education can't just be about the presumed normal average student with all the sort of problems and biases that can be built into ideas like normal or average, that it should be about more than that. And then the learner-driven stuff is about more than intellectual stairmasters, right? That, that we want to get beyond the, what they call the disposable assignment and have students generating new knowledge that resonates beyond the walls of the classroom. So that's a, that's a pretty imperfect and, and ham-fisted definition of something we spend a lot of time thinking about. It's probably good enough for our purposes today. So access-oriented, learner-driven. The other thing to say about open educational practices and open pedagogy is it can be a pretty heavy lift. If I talk to a faculty member and I say, I want you to replace that textbook with this open textbook, okay, I need to maybe revise my syllabus a little or look at the TOC and see if it fits. But asking us to do access-oriented stuff in a way that's ethical, that centers students' agency, asking them to do that, that sort of learner-driven stuff, there's a, there's a big ask that's built into that. So on our campus, we've had a tremendous amount of success putting in the time and sitting down one-on-one -on -one and saying, okay, for your course, Let's change it up completely. For your course, we're going to do this other thing. But when we start to talk about scaling that stuff on the next slide, when we start talking about not just looking at the really cool models that we have out there um, for changing a classroom or talking of, to a faculty member about the values and the practices that they bring, but when we talk about actually scaling that up to work that's done across, next slide please, thank you, the state level or a system level or a consortium level or a national level, that can start to get more complicated. And that's the problem statement that I'm going to set up and then do the, the good lawyerly thing of setting up a problem and then running away. So David has to solve the problem here today. How do we scale this open pedagogy stuff that we're excited about? David, I'm going to shut well, up. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think one way in, the, in which we've attempted to address this at NC State is through our open pedagogy incubator. And some of you might be familiar with already or seen a past presentation about this. 
This is a program that was NC State exclusive um, in its sort of first iteration. And it, sort of, it was planned before the pandemic and it was gonna be an in-person program whereby uh, a, a small cohort of faculty come together with librarians and they develop competencies in open pedagogy through this series of um, curated readings, cohort discussions and workshops that take in different tools of, ped of open pedagogy, such as Wiki.edu or Hypothesis, among other things, and then the theories and the values of pedagogy. So the way it worked was, would be that if you were a faculty member and this sounded like it might be exciting to you, you would apply to the incubator and then your application would be reviewed and then it ultimately might be accepted for the first cohort or it may ask you to wait and join the second one. So our first cohort, we had six members, we had 19 applications and we actually provided a very small in the grand scheme of things grant for those interested in joining that program. Our structure is based around these three sort of key meetings. The first meeting is kind of like the kickoff meeting of the program. This is where you come into the room, you meet the other folks who are going to be part of your cohort. So, and you meet the librarians and so on. And this is the point where really where we find out about, well, why are you here? What do you find exciting about this? Why do you want to do something different than what you've been doing up to this particular point? Our second meeting is at the point really whereby you've, you've been through the sort of core readings of the program. You've taken part in some of the workshops. You have an idea by this point of well, what's exciting to you? What, do you think might not work in the context of your, your pedagogy and so on? And things that you're unsure about, so you can sort of bounce off of your different cohort members and everything else. So you don't yet have a concrete plan for exiting the program with an open intervention in mind, but you're sort of at the halfway point um, of getting there. And then the final meeting is you've completed the program, you've taken on board everything that we've thrown at you, and you leave the program with this concrete idea for an, for an open, open intervention and implementation, whether it might be a wiki edu assignment, building a textbook of students, writing quiz questions rather than have students taking a quiz, or just making your, your syllabi open. So all sorts of different levels of, of open intervention. Um, now we supplement this with different workshops. I mentioned a few of them already. We do ask our participants to attend at least four, but on the menu, is sort of far more than that. And what we've tended to find is, folks gen generally seem to prefer taking as many as possible. So rather than the minimum amount, they wanna take on board as much as we can, as much as we can offer. And then as mentioned, you know, come the end of the program, you should leave hopefully with a concrete idea of an open intervention. So the way that we've sort of done it is sort of a flexible blended structure. I mentioned this was going to be an in-person experience. The pandemic sort of um, saw to that. So it quickly became an online only. And in some ways, I think that was kind of like a happy accident because I'll, as I'll come on to talk about, I think this might be the ideal sort of format for something like this. So you, again, so foundation meeting, workshops, inspiration. And then the second stage is where we sort of turn over part of the program to the participants and we provide a much larger menu we ask for them to decide amongst themselves different topics that they want to explore so the first half of it is mainly like the core stuff that is essential the second half is much more elective in its nature and we've been quite intentional in terms of how we've built these cohorts um, this is interdisciplinary um, as fun as it might have been, we didn't want to have a bunch of, you know, mathematicians talking to another bunch of mathematicians. Um, that might make sense in other scenarios as I'll come on to talk about. But for this one, we were keen to have instructors at different stages of career from different departments in different disciplines. And we found that, I think, across um, our first and our second cohort on the next slide as well. Next slide, please. So this is very much a model that we think is, is built to scale. We've done it successfully at, at a local level, but we think through virtue of this being online only, this is something that is scalable for certain. Um, uh, and our next tackle to challenge was the system level one. So next slide, please, Will. So NC State, as some of you will be aware, we are one of 17 schools in the University of North Carolina system. And you know, we are keen, like, we're very open-minded. The community aspect is important to us. So 
the taking the incubator and transplanting it and broadening it out to a system level is something that made a lot of sense for us and for our friends elsewhere too. Now I'm going to come on to talk about a sort of particular pilot program um, regarding the math pathways, um, which is a system level sort of framework for our sort of introductory or lower level math courses. But I just wanted to provide like a bit of context before I move on to that. So um, math, as many of you know, and I know from my math GCSE, all too familiar, <laughs> it's an extremely difficult subject for a lot of students. At the system level, um, about sort of uh, one third of students didn't complete their, their math um, requirements. They um, had to repeat or uh, impeded their progress or so on. And this is particularly true in some of those particularly challenging gateway courses like algebra, which is basically my kryptonite, right? Um, I did my undergraduate in England, so I didn't have to do this portion very luckily. Will unfortunately did. Um, so with this in mind, the system um, decided to approach this from a different, different angle, and they created these sort of alternate pathways, the math pathway program, which was implemented in around sort of 2020. So this is from a student's perspective, the math course that you take is more closely aligned with your major. So for instance, if you're a liberal arts student, so theatre or humanities, so on, you won't have to take the college algebra. You'll be taking something that's more closely aligned with your, your future career goals. So a curriculum is developed that's just more responsive to students' needs and also just more equitable and applicable to what they're interested in in, in, in studying. And an advantage that the Math Pathways program has perhaps over some of the other disciplines is it has this common framework that runs throughout the system for all undergrad and lower level math courses um, and also within our community college system as well so it enables this almost like seamless transfer across the system so i hope you're still with me um, on that i never thought i'd be in front of a group of people talking about math education <laughs> um, so this presented an opportunity for us so math OER has been done many times before. It's often at like an individual level. When you try to scale it to a system or a consortial level, it's been sort of much less successful. But bearing in mind the advantages of the framework of our gateway courses in the system and the opportunities we see at open education to do things at scale, this kind of was like a, like in many ways, like a happy marriage of convenience. So, what we decided to do was pilot things, bring together a bunch of math instructors, a bunch of librarians, and a bunch of instructional designers or learning technologists, give them another, another name, into a, like a large group. So we tried to represent as many of the schools in the system as possible, and I think we near enough hit most of them. Um, we were, um, I, I should say this, um, ably like enabled, uh, generously funded by the Lyricist Foundation. Uh, foundation? Lyricist? I think it's the Lyricist Foundation. Yeah. The Lyricist provided us some money in order to sort of perform this work and therefore was born the Summer Institute for Open Course Development. Try saying that after a few whispers. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a program that essentially looked to take the incubator model and apply it to more of a discipline specific or we'll solve a problem, which was um, creating math OER or open educational practices at scales. And it all sort of, sort of um, uh, was brought around this particular math course, which is the one to my far right here, this quantitative reasoning math course, which most liberal arts uh, majors in the system level are required to take. So this course was redesigned through virtue of this program and used by hundreds of educators across the UNC system. And maybe even more importantly, has like significant buy-in from those educators. So imagine like the impact for students across 17 schools. You know, imagine the, uh, the scale in which this work um, can affect. And also again, going back, to community, going back to the community aspect, through bringing all these folks together and developing localized inclusive OER and OEP, we were able to develop this like, community of practice because one thing that's like, really important to make sure that things succeed and open in general is that it has to be sustainable. And to be sustainable, often you do need to have an ongoing community of practice around it that can work together on these challenges. 
So in terms of the activities, we broke it into sort of four chunks. So the first one was the course mapping in design, where the faculty and the instructional designers sort of worked together to map the course, identify what the resource needs are for the lessons, activities, and the assessments. The librarians participated in those meetings, and we used one of our skills, you know, to good effect, which is we're quite good at finding stuff, right? So we could locate the appropriate OER resources. Then we moved on to building the course. So faculty, the IDs and the librarians collaborated to build the course content in an open, shareable environment. And then critically, training and guides were provided to support faculty who then come on to teach the course. So our timeline sort of looks like this. Um, we applied to and were successful with Lyricist back in the early spring of last year, probably about almost a year ago to date, maybe. And sort of work began in earnest in sort of June 2022. September 2022, stage three was the real sort of critical moment where folks participated in this sort of incubator model I spoke to you about earlier on. We're now in the course delivery and the assessment phase. And then we'll move on to sort of you know, any revision that needs to take place on a white paper. Now, of course, will be the toolkit being published for the wider community. So in terms of outreach, sort of how we got the sort of the word out there, one of the things that we were keen to do, because it's one of those things where if you build it, people necessarily won't come unless they know about it. We, uh, we connected with the chief academic officers uh, and disseminated this information at the university and the community college level to make them aware of it. So in terms of communications, that also looks like things like a lot of, a lot of webinars, <laughs> blog posts, both during and then what we're moving on to now is, is more sort of post. And then that white paper and that toolkit that will be developed and made available. This is my sustainability piece in our UNC system um, OER implementation collection. So it's available for anybody to find anywhere in the world and use the toolkit that's been developed. And then pivoting very slightly back to our original model, because this seemed to work very well, we've uh, also, as of like right now, also have a system level incubator, which is moving outside of the math discipline and moving back to our interdisciplinary model. Um, and again, we're midway through, but things seem to be progressing very well. And we're already talking about what we can do to further scale that this fall or autumn. And this is our current cohort. So again, representative of um, the different schools, different years, different um, levels of experience, career progression, and of course, different disciplines. Reflection. So what have we, what have we learned so far? Um, we've learned a lot, right? <laughs> um, there's many different perspectives for participants, but also instructors. And that's one of the most exciting things about an incubator is that it's not a bunch of people coming together and agreeing with each other. There's some challenging conversations to be had within it. But all of that is constructive. And um, I think open interventions at all levels is important too. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to overlook it, but just making your syllabi open is still a significant step, you know, elsewhere. So if you're, the way that you teach a course, um, for instance, if it doesn't lend itself well to some of these like um, open pedagogy tools, um, it might, but if it doesn't, then it's not a bad thing still that your syllabus is open and available for, for others as well. I touched upon the, the, the participant guided um, stuff as well. We think this is really important because again, going back down to one of the other one, other points that we make here, folks, come into the incubator with different levels of experience and knowledge as well. And it is often the beginning rather than the journey. So allowing folks like freedom to actually dictate different um, stages of the incubator, I think is really, really important and acts as a, as a guide because ultimately you do want to, um, you do want to um, provide information and everything else and skills to folks that are, are, are real to them and applicable as well. And then the support is, is um, important too. I mentioned at the beginning, our first cohort, we provided a small grant. Well, actually, afterwards, when we were in the stage of collecting feedback, we asked them, how important was that grant? You know, was that like a deal breaker for joining the cohort? And not one of them said that they would have not taken part, you know, um, but for the grant. 
So we haven't provided any funding since. Folks are happy to take time out of everything else that they do, um, teaching, research, and so on, to join this, this incubator model. You the next problem. Yeah, and so, so to David's point, I think one of the most significant outcomes of this work has been the community of practice success, right? The people matter more than the resources. That, that there are some people who are now doing open pedagogy as, as broadly as you can imagine, and they're telling all their peers about it, and they've been incredible evangelists. And there are other people who said, I have a class of 400 people, and that all sounds really cool for you all with smaller courses. I've opened my syllabus, I'm bringing the values into it, but I love to have feedback that I can get from other people in the same field or, or maybe um, from different fields and different perspectives as well. We've also tried to sort of keep that loop that David showed going where every time we do a new cohort, we'll have speakers from the cohort before talk about, this was really cool and I'm glad I learned about this. And they said to do this, but that's a bad idea. Just ignore them on that point or whatever, it's, right? To get that, that authentic feedback has been really valuable. Um, it's been tremendously exciting for me to go from our sort of local, this works at one institution to the regional and national model. Um, and our, our great hope is that we will throw out a line and somebody will go like, we should really have those conversations across national borders as well. Getting different perspectives can mean different things. Um, so we're going to share on the next slide our materials. If you want to see what we've been up to, um, those are on OSF. And we're going to open up the floor for questions now, but we, we hope this is, has something useful for everybody and we can start to continue to build up our community of practice around how does this work in different contexts and in different ways. So that's a lot of us talking. Yeah, please. Can you go back to the slide with the uh, OSF link? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Sure. <laughs> we, can, we will share out all the slides which have all the links as well. But yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thanks for asking. Yeah, pretty. Does it automatically own all the material that you produce? Is that, um, um, how do you say that? Um, is there a community manager, for example? Yeah. That's a really good question. So the training materials are, I think, owned by the institution and openly licensed so everybody can use them. The teaching materials that, that are developed by individual faculty generally belong to that faculty member themselves. My buddy Josh and I back there have been having a spirited debate about who owns educational materials in different contexts. And with my lawyer hat on, I would love to spend an hour or, or six hours talking to you about that. But the short answer is, generally speaking, faculty own the stuff they make and we own the training materials so we can openly license them so everybody can use them. Great question, thank you. Other questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah, it's very interesting program to put together, and it seems to be popular also from what you said, because yes. you have more applications than those people accept. So what's your magic formula? Because we know that academics don't have that much time, and say, oh, I don't have time for this, blah, blah, blah. So what, what was the attractive thing? And I'm also interested, what changed after they completed? Mm, good question. I've been talking a lot. Do you want to jump in or do you want me to talk a little more? So I just put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of things. Yeah. Of the answer is David. David is the match. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think for those of you who attended our session yesterday, we, you know, we've got a um, well established sort of OER program, old, old textbook, it's been successful over the years, you know, and there's folks all the time, you know, who um, are interested in, in, in open in general. But for whatever reason, they haven't yet made the jump to sort of where we are. Maybe there's not the existing content out there, and therefore they, the ask is heavier and so on. But they maintain an interest in like the principles of open education. So when you talk to them about open pedagogy, which in many ways is a further sort of step along, suddenly it might be more like applicable. When you talk about maybe redesign, redesigning an assignment, perhaps. Um, so there's different sort of routes in, I think. Um, we also, I mean, it's fair to say, we've got a very effective communications network so at the libraries. We have our own communications department, which I don't think is common across every academic library, who do a great job of promoting us, helping get the word out, really reaching faculty where they are. Again, yeah, and another thing, again, going back to our textbook, we do have that community on campus, well established for many years, where we can say to folks, hey, we're doing the Open Pedagogy Incubator. You know, do you know anyone, you know, in your department that might be interested? Would you share a post or a blog post or something else? So we have a few things like in our, in our favor to that regard as well. So did I miss? No, a, a question about what they did after. Um, so I think we, oh, yeah. David talked about the open intervention and sort of meeting people where they are. Um, everybody has done cool stuff and we could do a presentation on any of the people who have participated um, each sort of in the context of their discipline. But the main thing that they have done is continue to be excited by and inspired this stuff. And so when they talk about their work at their conferences, they say, I did this wacky incubator program and look at this new assignment. My students love it. Or, you know, I, I use this new resource and it saved a bunch of money. So it's, it's 
getting people invested in something they're already invested in, which is like doing the stuff they dedicated their life to doing well. And that's been a message that's really resonated with folks. Really good question. Do we have time for one more or should we give the other? Yeah, just one more and then that one. Okay, if there's one more very quick, if not, we're happy to hush up. I'm excited to see the next presentation. Oh, I think this is perfect. I'm gonna get out. Oh, you're fine. And, and then still just five minutes before we finish. So we have to it Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for being here and wonderful presentation to you. Well, thank you. I just want to point out that David and I match. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> David and I have the same color shoes. So yeah, I'm missing the color shirt, but um, so welcome. My name is Christina Calhoun. In America, they say it Calhoun because no one knows what to do with the silent QU. Um, but I am the instructional design and online learning librarian at Oklahoma State University Libraries. Um, and these are my colleagues, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. I'm Kathy Esseler, the coordinator of Open OK State at Oklahoma State University and a GOG member, but I didn't get my penguin, but I have penguins. <laughs> And I'm Holly Ryder. I'm the director for teaching and learning in our library at OSU. So thank you all for being here today um, in this session. Oh, and also we have um, the slides are linked up there. If you want to use a little QR code or go to it, um, the little URL. The link has also been dropped into Discord and Twitter. Everywhere. Um, so today we are going to talk about, and I hope you forgive me using notes. Uh, my brain's still recovering from a I went through cancer treatment the past year, so my uh, I, I'm cancer free. Um, but my uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, but my short term memory is uh, a little bit to be desired. So um, if you so we hope that today, you know, uh, we want to bring you into this conversation about learning analytics and its use in uh, open education resources. Um, we've done that in our teaching and learning practice at the Oklahoma State University Libraries, um, and specifically with OER. And so to do this, we're going to um, kind of couch the conversation in that scholarly and ethical conversation um, around student data privacy and ethics. Um, we're going to also talk about the path that we took to do this um, amongst ourselves, um, and um, we'll provide some guidance if you want to do this in your own space. And I'm going to interject here in an unscripted moment. And we, uh, our program is guided by Catherine Cronin's 2018 uh, exploration of open practices. Yes. Uh, if you're wondering what informs this intentionally ethical approach. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. We love Catherine. Okay, so first we're going to start framing our conversation uh, with some about the learning analytics and student data privacy. Um, so we have a shared understanding of what we're all talking about here and why. Okay, so learning analytics. Um, what is it? Um, so there's all kinds of data, as we know, that are collected on our students these days. Um, they can't go two steps without having data collected on them. Um, and a lot of it is for good, right? You know, they use it in uh, advising to track where they are on campus. It was used a lot during COVID for protection. Um, but um, with the evolving, so rapidly evolving technology landscape, especially since COVID, um, it's a little bit difficult to keep up with things. Um, and especially when it comes to student safety and their privacy and being able to respect their autonomy. Um, and so, uh, but the type of data we're going to talk about today is specific to teaching and learning, and that's learning analytics. Um, so there's not one accepted definition that people use, but we're going to use the one from the first international conference on learning analytics and knowledge. Happened first, so why not? Um, and learning analytics is data about students um, and their, uh, in their learning environments and basically how they're learning, what they're using to learn, what they're doing there, how they're interacting with it. Um, and we use it to understand and optimize their learning, basically. It's for their benefit. Um, so with instructional design, using learning analytics in instructional design and OER, um, it can be incredibly beneficial. Um, it provides information about the pedagogy and about the design choices. Um, it can also help us improve over time um, the teaching and learning materials that we use. Um, most of us have stakeholders also that we report to and we have to show, hey, here's why this is working. And so it can help with program and material efficacy as well. So with that in mind, um, and I want to encourage anyone to just either shout out or if you feel more comfortable raising your hand, um, if you use any type of learning analytics within your OER right now, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, but if you'd like to share with us what you do, I'll tell you what we do in a bit. Only if you tell me first. <laughs> and if you're not, that's totally fine. I'm glad you're here today. 
I mean, I know you guys talked about feedback that you got from people and that's key. That's one of the big ways that we get data is literally feedback from the students themselves. Yeah. I'm using the learning analytics to uh, test if it is good, if the questions, the, the tasks, everything in uh, the OER is suitable and actual good. So if a complete group is um, making diff, uh, something wrong or, uh, you know, okay, I have to adjust it or... So it's not always to uh, test the student, it's also to test the material if it's okay. Absolutely, yeah. Is it meeting those objectives that you set for it? And yeah, for sure, that's one of the big ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can say as an interview, um, we can check uh, whether the resources or the practices are good and uh, the, will it uh, effective for other people? Mm -hmm. So how we can reuse whether it is. Yes. Yeah, I love that. She brought up uh, being able to, is it effective? Can you reuse it? Um, a sustainable thing that we can go ahead with. Right, I love that. Like showing is it sustainable? That's a great point. Thank you. Anyone else wish? Okay, well, thank you guys both for sharing. I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, we talked about the good ways that data and learning analytics can be used, but there is a lot of also very well documented cases of it not being used for very uh, good purposes, kind of nefarious, if you will. Um, uh, there's a variety of laws and policies that are meant to protect students, um, but a lot of them, and they very obviously vary from country to country, um, and I can speak specifically to the U.S., um, and not necessarily for everybody, that's for sure not for everybody, <laughs> um, but I will tell you in the U.S., they're, they leave a lot to be desired in the way of protecting our students in practice. Um, so they also um, usually lack required safety measures like a documented do this, do this, do this. Um, and that's, you know, there isn't one place we can look and say, yes, this is exactly what we do. Um, and so, I mean, for example, FERPA in the United States, um, it protects students to a certain degree, um, but there's a ton of leeway and there's actually a lot of loopholes in it that people can get around <laughs> to harm, harm students, you know, uh, when you look at it, um, you know, Companies can use that data in a lot of ways that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and that's where a lot of the danger lies is what can it be used for later. Um, additionally, since there isn't that one prescribed way of handling data that everyone follows legally or otherwise, um, it usually comes down to the ethics of it. And the ethics conversation runs a spectrum. There's not two people who are going to tell you the exact same thing, usually. Um, I'm sure there are, but. Um, but with this all combined, we're putting students at risk for a great harm unless we take great care with it. Um, so, and especially if it's students from marginalized groups who are definitely at much more of a risk, and that's also very well documented. So, um, sadly, data practices, no matter what they are, are never neutral. Um, they aren't without the potential for harm. And there's numerous documented cases of students being harmed by that collection and use. So data breaches, um, using data against marginalized students or uh, marginalized populations, um, bias in algorithms, bias in decision-making based off of data, um, companies profiting off of student data, um, and even use of student data without their knowledge or consent. Um, all of this can happen while institutions are fully in compliance with laws. Um, and so, oh, if you could click one more, yeah, Audrey Waters, um, she says that we have confused surveillance for care. When you work for an institution that collects or trades data, you're making it easy to sur surveil people and the stakes are high. They're always high for the most vulnerable. Um, and I remember reading this the first time and thinking, oh my, <laughs> that's, that's true. And so I really took her uh, words there to heart. Um, we all did. I, I speak for us, but yes. Um, so what do we do with that? Oh, oh sorry. No, nope, you're fine. Just gotta, there we go. Oh, what the heck happened? One? That's fine. That's fine. It's the next one. <coughs> um, so all that, oh, there you go. Say that any conversation, any policy, any work that you're going to do with learning analytics needs to, um, also have considerations for student data privacy and student data safety. Those can't be separated. Um, 
and special care has to be taken. So let's talk about what ethical student data privacy looks like in practice. So what did we do? Well, well, before we get to that, we're going to talk about, uh, you may have heard people say, well, students don't care anyway. They'll, they'll just sign up and give their email or their data to anybody. That is actually not true. There has been a lot of um, research, especially recently. Um, there's a couple groups who have been doing a ton of research on this. Um, and it is very well documented that students really, really care about their data privacy. Uh, what it comes down to is that they just don't know who to ask, where to go, what to do about it. It's very overwhelming. If you've ever tried to read a privacy policy, it sucks. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, so we took uh, Amy Collar in 2017. She had this challenge and we actually took it to heart um, and it informed our practice. She said to recognize and deconstruct our perspectives on the relationship of data to our understanding of student learning. So taking what we thought we knew, what we thought was good and proper, or maybe what we'd learn along the way and say, huh, wait a minute, how's this affecting students? What choices do they have? How are we helping them with this? So that is literally what we did. We took apart what we thought we knew and we put it back together. Um, and the ways that we did this as a team, our teaching and learning team at the library, um, was with lots and lots of reading. Uh, if you've ever tried to wade into the scholarly conversation, it is deep and wide and <laughs> it knows no bounds. Um, it does, but you know, I'm being, uh, I'm exaggerating. Like right, 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 right. Um, no, but no, you can easily wade into it as well. I have some resources at the end. But um, so we did a lot of listening. We did a lot of talking to people from different groups um, and just really learning um, before we tried to do anything else. Uh, then we went through um, each step in the following slides. You'll see what we did. Um, but we started figuring out what our values were as a team um, and as educators and librarians and instructional designers and uh, go, really going from there. Then we jumped into that scholarly conversation ourselves around learning analytics, student data privacy, privacy and ethics. Um, we looked at some different frameworks that are out there. At the time of us constructing this, there was um, a handful of really, really, really excellent ones. Now there are a lot more, so yay, there's a lot to look at. Um, but those really informed our practice, the codes of practice, frameworks, principles. Um, and then we eventually created our own data privacy framework. Um, important to that was asking students to give their input and to shape that for us, because after all, this was about them and for them. And I'm going to, so in the United States, policy is law. And so that's why we're using the word framework. We can call it a data policy because we are not in charge of a state university, uh, nor apparently are we in charge of the library. <laughs> but uh, we are in charge of our own little team. But so that's why framework can be substituted, I think, for an understanding of policy as, as you have over here. Yeah, that was one of the lessons we learned uh, very quickly was do not call this a policy. You are representing nobody and nobody can sue you for this. So because if they do, you're my job. So anyway. Um, so step one of that, what I mentioned, uh, it was to articulate the values that inform our practice. And so a lot of times these values are, you know, included in your mission and vision, if you have that, um, your teams, your libraries, your universities, whatever that might be. Um, and for us, there were several things that we all valued as a team and individually in our own practice um, that we already were incorporating and wanted to incorporate into this as well. So you see the ethics of care. That's what Kathy mentioned at the beginning, uh, Catherine Cronin, um, her ethics of care really did inform that we put students in their well-being first, um, and that is a guiding beacon for us. Um, through our teaching and learning, we aim to identify, question, and combat oppressive practices. Um, so that liberatory, liberatory and critical practice um, for us, we, we wanted to restore and protect the equity of students um, and assist students in doing the same for themselves and others. Um, we also seek to incorporate student voice and experience and shape our practice with it. Um, and as Collier put it, we want to provide digital sanctuaries for students or digital spaces that are safe for them to be in and that they feel safe to be in, where we're actively protecting them and they know that they can go there safely. So that ethical <coughs> scholarly stance, once we waded into that little conversation there, um, uh, it could take up years of sessions really to talk about all of it. I'm not going to say years because that sounds overwhelming, but days of sessions to talk about what the spectrum is out there um, of the ethics of student data privacy. But I'll tell you what we um, included in ours. Um, and at the end, there are a bunch of references that you can go to if you'd like to, um, to get you started on that. 
Um, but in a nutshell, we believe that student data, data privacy should be prioritized to protect students from harm, to respect their autonomy, um, empower them and establish equity, provide protections for their intellectual freedom, build a trust relationship between students in the library, and as part of specific duties as librarians to enable students literacy with data privacy. Um, and so this was really key to us to guiding, excuse me, how we would be able to use or collect their data. So when it comes to learning analytics and OER, there is an additional layer there um, of ethical complexity, if you will. Um, we are striving to provide free or reduced cost to materials, and that shouldn't, and to reduce those financial barriers to education. Um, and so we shouldn't be exchanging that for uh, their data being used in some way. Um, if we're saying free or reduced cost, we're going to say free or reduced cost. I mean it. <laughs> um, so we so, say we do say free. Right, free. Yes, our uh, yeah materials that we offer are free. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Kathy. Yes. Um, yeah, because usually when you say free, that equates to commodification of data, like you are the product, right? If you give your email for something, you know, free, uh, what do we have here? Burger King, a free burger at Burger King, they've just sold your data. So, <laughs> um, so in offering OER, we committed to doing so without that exchange of goods. Um, and so we believe it's a public good and it shouldn't be commodified. So, uh, deciphering paradigms. I mentioned earlier that um, that lack of standards um, for student data use. So, in response to that, a number of institutions and committees and organizations sought to create some ethical frameworks for using this, um, for using student data. And like I mentioned at the time that we started doing it, um, there was a number of these exemplars. Um, it was much smaller than it is now, but now it's really a lot of institutions have them posted um, on their pages about privacy. Um, and so we're going to share. These are the ones that initially formed our practice. Um, very appreciative to the Open University, uh, GIST, uh, NISO, um, the Stanford Carroll and Ithaca SR project, um, UC Berkeley and UC, or sorry, UC, University of Hawaii at Manila. Um, and one specific concept was incredibly influential to us, um, and it helped us set some ethical parameters that really um, kind of tied everything together. Um, and this is the concept of infor information fiduciaries. Um, and it was originally introduced by Balkan and then um, Jones, Rubel, and LeClaire um, uh, added it for higher, ed uh, excuse me, specified it for higher education institutions. Um, and this is a concept that explores how um, that when we collect and use data, uh, that we're these information fiduciaries, we're responsible for it, and we should act um, <clears throat> ethically uh, because we have the onus to protect students um, and their data collection. So we use this concept basically as a checklist for data use parameters for ourselves um, and to only collect data that directly benefits students and their educational experiences, supports our university and library mission, vision, and goals, honors and protects students' intellectual freedom, and creates and help upholds a trust bond between us and the students. Um, one of the things that you'll find as you wade into this conversation is those ethical things that are at stake, and some of the big ones are students' autonomy and their intellectual freedom. Is it being protected? Is it being sold in some way? Are you allowing them to create and be who they are through these materials, or is there some mechanism that's watching them? Um, so, so once these values and ethics were set for us, we um, and we had those previous paradigms that we looked at, um, we started creating our own framework. And as we mentioned, it is a framework and not a policy. So we came up with some core principles. That was the first thing we decided to do was what are our core principles that will guide their use? Um, and you can see here responsibility, transparency, privacy and consent, confidentiality and security and access. Um, and we thought that these best captured our values and ethics that we decided on, um, as well as the paradigms that we valued. Um, each of these principles lays out our specific parameters and practices for data collection, use, analysis, storage, um, and as well as student choice with their data. Um, we have a longer document that is um, still in the editing phase, but if any student were to ask for it, they would absolutely have access to it. That literally lays out all of these things for every piece of learning analytics that we collect. Um, so they can say, 
oh, that's where it's going. That's how it's being used. So. I think five. Oh my goodness, I'm talking yeah. too much. Okay, so we set a precedent to only collect for learning design improvement, um, showing the efficacy of our program, or if we had to share it with instructors of record. Um, and we always first defined whenever we encountered a new learning analytics something. Um, we were going to define the objectives of that collection first. Um, and this just goes over how we did uh, what we did to add it when we put the policy in place, but we could skip that. So it's very much the opposite of collect everything you can just in case you need it later. Do not do that. Yes. Thank you. Um, a student voice was incorporated. Holly taught a um, three credit credit class for a couple of semesters and every semester. Oh, no, she taught it for a lot of semesters, but six over. Years. Yeah. <laughs> so over a few semesters of those six years, um, she would ask students to review it when she was teaching about data privacy and they would give feedback and we shaped it according to what they said. And we will likely do that again um, very soon. Because, Probably in a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> um, some pitfalls, I already mentioned that being able to call it, you know, a policy versus a framework, you know, what's outside of your control, the time it takes to do this process is a pitfall. Um, by and beyond our team, we actually got a lot of uh, pushback from some people who have a foot in the student data that we're collecting, but didn't really want to be involved with what we were doing. Um, and then Google and Amazon, they're just everywhere. You can't get around them. So our way around that was telling students how to avoid them. Um, but yeah. And acknowledging where they are part of that collection process. Yep, exactly. Um, and so now we have our guidelines posted. It's you can link to it. It's also posted on our Open OK State um, platform. Um, we use XAPI and Grassblade LRS to collect those learning analytics. Um, the only thing it does collect that I cannot get rid of at the moment is their IP address. But as soon as it's collected, I delete it forever. Um, and we have standards in place for how to protect that data. Um, we also have we use Google Analytics in our Pressbooks platform, um, but we do notify students about how they can get rid of that uh, or go around it. Um, uh, I, uh, there's an OK State data literacy project that just came up. We were so excited about it this past um, semester where they've involved us in being able to tell students on campus, here's how data everywhere on campus is used. And the library was able to share what we do. Um, and I'll also be holding in a workshop uh, this summer semester about uh, student data privacy that came from the Datafied Classroom Research Project. I encourage you to check it out. They will be publishing those materials soon. I'm piloting it. Them. So it's not quite up yet. Um, the rest of these are about how to do this on your own, which is basically what I just said. And then there's steps for it. So Holly, if you just want to put them on the screen and then uh, we could take some questions. Well, wow. those are up there. If you'd like. I don't want to keep you. Lunch is important. So that's the end. Are there time for questions? That's yeah, yeah, questions. questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for Christina. <laughs> Ask you some questions. This is our first conference. Yes. Like, first of all, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask what is the difference between learning analytics in the general student data that university collecting That's and OER? Question. What is the special things here about the OER? Because you put it, I know that we are in the OER conference. Right. Uh, is there a difference in if, if the framework should be uh, different? Uh, and second is if students like to do like opt out, mm -hmm. do you do like opt in or opt out? What is the way, way that you are enabling or disabling the collection of the data? I'm going to remember, I'm going to start with the opt out I question because I, I, that's one. what I remember. <laughs> um, so with opt out, what we do is in that document I talked about where it talks about all the um, each individual um, type of learning analytics, whether it's a tutorial, open OK State platform. Um, there's a section for each of them that says, here's how you can opt out. Um, and so, for instance, if it's Google Analytics, there's a browser, which is so backwards to me. There's a browser plugin you have to put in, a Google plugin you have to put in, in order to avoid Google. I, anyway, um, but they can also, uh, you know, uh, email us if they have an issue with it. Um, and so there are different options depending on what it is um, that they're talking about, or that they're using. 
Um, we have Holly's email up on there. So if they ever have any questions, they can go talk to her, or email her. We haven't had anybody. No, mm -hmm. and you would know because if they emailed me, it would go directly to you. <laughs> it would be forwarded to Christina saying, please help me answer this. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, and you said how, okay, so the first one was, how is but this Google, different? Uh, Google Analytics is uh, aggregate data, right? So you don't right. get it into individual student level. Right. Level, right? Yeah, I'm not I worried about this. Use the Google Analytics just to communicate with the faculty and say, you've had this many hits on your book, right. someone's using it, you know, on this continent and things like that. But you're not collecting individual level data? No, no, because they don't sign into our books. We, their, our books are right now are completely open. Uh, so if the faculty member has H5P in there or something, and they, they can link it through their Canvas, and so it's protecting their Canvas, and then, yeah. But and then the Canvas will collect the data. Right. Say that because it's, mm -hmm. the idea is that you could, I have so many problems with learning analytics now with my institution mm -hmm. because I like to, yeah, collecting a huge amount of data, yeah. but they don't allow me to use it for research purposes, right. only for internal purposes. Right. And they don't care about internal purposes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to do research. And, that's why. So I think the framework that you, you present is very, very smart, very good. But I think that there are so many questions that you will have to deal with uh, along oh, the way. Sure. Uh, yeah. And one of it is the, is the idea of the individual level uh, data that the systems are, are collecting. And I think the students don't care about it, by the way, because they have those machines that collect data all the time. And we have you know, microphones collecting data now and will ask us now and then. And we don't care about it, right? I ask so I, I think the students don't care about it, but we are giving more too much attention to that. Ah. But if you think that it's, they care about that and it's important, ah. that, there's so, so much research now that tells us they do care so much. When you ask yeah. someone, uh, do you like that? So we like that, but it's you raise awareness. But, but this is other discussion. But I would like to ask so because the systems are collecting all the time data, and the question now if we want to analyze that because. Because the data is available, if we are enabling um, opt in, opt out, constant agreement, is that so how how we deal with that? Yeah, it's very. Go ahead, Kathy. We can't use student data for research purposes without going through the institutional re review board process. So there'd already be we would already have to be pushing buttons and clicking things to bring that situation about. Right. right. Yeah. So we're not really losing anything by not collecting it up front. Because we can't use it anyway without permission. So right. that's a good, good question. Though, that going back to our ethics of care too, like we always put, you know, that's the first thing we start with always is how our students get impacted by it, you know, and so that kind of drives everything we do. And if we were to do research, there would be different hoops we would jump through to make sure we can protect it. I'm going to jump in and just say that our time is up. So if you are really need to go to lunch, you will not be offended you <laughs> have to leave to go get food. If you want to stay, we'll hang out for a few minutes and talk and answer questions. Yes. Yeah. Because again, I think so. <laughs>